going to address just five points, and there are many, just five issues which we need in order to secure the help of Allah Rabbul Izzah. Number one, and listen, the formulas are from the Quran. Allah Rabbul Izzah says, وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And it is a duty incumbent upon us to help the believers. As such, the first requirement in attaining the help of Allah Rabbul Izzah is to be believers. Is to be true believers. And what is Iman? In the hadith of Jibreel, where Jibreel alayhi salam asks the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِيمَانِ Tell me, O Muhammad, what is Iman? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ These are the articles of Iman. You all taught it, Amantu Billah wa Malaikatihi wa Kutubihi wa Rusulih, since childhood. It is in all your hearts. But to believe to the level where it affects your actions is what is required. If I put a bottle of poison here, and you know it is poison, I say drink it, you go, no, I believe it will kill me. That is belief that it affects your conscious behavior. You don't touch it because you know it's harms. To believe in Allah Rabbul Izza to the extent that it affects your conscious behavior is what is the requirement of a mu'min. So that when you behave, you say, if I do this, it will displease Allah Rabbul Izza. Or, Azab of Allah will come. Or, Allah will punish me. Belief to that extent where it affects your conscious behavior. And belief, like you know Allah Rabbul Izza so well and so intimately that when you rely, you rely on something and on some being that you know. Like, for example, the Prophet وسلم, is taking a siesta nap in one of the journeys, and he وسلم, hung his sword off a branch of a, a tree. So one of the disbelievers came, took his sword, pulled it out, and put it on the blessed neck of the Prophet And putting the sword on the neck and understand swords Swords are not spoons, they are sharp things, they are made to cut and kill. So when a sword's on your neck, if he just pulls, the vein's gone. You know, the jugular opens, you die. So he has the sword on the throat, on the neck of the Prophet wasallam, and he asks, who will save you from me today? You see, normal person thinks, ah, uh, there's someone behind you. You know, if you want to be a tactician, pick up bits of sand, throw it in his eye. Or say, there's someone behind you and maybe trip him. Or, you know, do one of those fancy martial arts back kicks or something. You know, you think like that. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his Iman and his Yaqeen and his Thiqa in Allah, Rabbul Izzah is 100%. Who will save you? Allah. Like the swords, what else do you have to... Like it's just a tip, a, a pull and you're gone. So who will save you from me today? He says, Allah. And the man's hand froze and the sword starts to shake and the sword falls. So the Prophet takes it and puts it on his neck. And who will save you from me today? Do you see? To have Iman to the level that it affects your behavior. That Allah is there. What do I have to fear? He's in the cave in Ghar Thawr. And subhanallah, it's a small little cave. You were there. So it's a small little cave. 
And the Prophet is slightly elevated like this, like this table. And the entrance is there. So if someone puts their head down like this, they can see you. So they have climbed up, Subhanal Khaliq, it, it, it boggles your mind. For anyone that has been to Ghar al Thawr, Ghar al Thawr is a two hour in a bit climb, correct? Two, me and Haji Fuad were there. Two hours in a bit climb, and I swear to you, I got halfway up. Halfway up the climb, and I looked down, and I had come way too far up. And I looked up, and there was too much to go. You know, helpless, like you want to cry, like I can't go down and I can't go up anymore, the legs are giving up. But the Prophet ﷺ climbed it, which is all right, because he has to, he's trying to save his life. But then you look at those that are following him, like they have come up climbing the two hour plus climb. Everything has been searched. It's just this one cave that they have to look into. It doesn't make sense not to look into this cave after a two hour journey. Two hours with stairs. Two hours, mashallah, two hours with stairs because they've made stairs now. In those days, it was just, it was climb, subhanallah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 40 is when he became a prophet, 43, um, uh, uh, 13 years in in Mecca, so he's 53 years old and he's made this climb. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now they come, the, the mushriks, to the mouth of the cave. So you're gone. And subhanallah, the people who write the seerah say, one of them decided, I, want, I need to go and answer the call of nature. So the, this is the mouth of the cave. He went around the back, and you remember that too. He went around the back, there's another hall here. There's another entrance up here. So he's answering the call of nature, probably somewhere here. And if he looks down, he can see them. And the others, if they look up, they can see him. And the Prophet in Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu are here. There are people here, and there's a person here. And two and a hundred camels as price on each of their heads. So Abu Bakr gets nervous, worried, Ya Rasul. And not for himself, for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam get harmed? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, La tahzan, inna allaha ma'ana. What are you afraid of Abu Bakr? Allah is with us. You see, this shows the strength of belief. The Iman, that Allah is with me, what am I to be afraid of? What is there to worry about? Who cares if he's come here and he has come here? Allah is here. Allah is with us as in with his help and with his aid and with his, um, with, uh, you know, in, in supporting us and in helping us. And subhanallah, Allah Rabbul Izzah saved them from here. So belief in Allah Rabbul Izza, to the level where your heart is set free from the fears of ordinary men. You know when you become a believer, you enter a separate league. It's the league of the believers, the league of the prophets, where they don't look at means anymore. I was in, I, I was in Hajj with our dear brother here, and I met a young man from, from South Africa. And he said he's unemployed and he's come here to Hajj. So I said, Akhi, where did you get the money? Because naturally, you, you know, you need money to come to Hajj. He goes, Allah, Allah does things through things without means. And he goes, Allah does things with means, without means, and against means. Like, whether, sometimes Allah does it through means. Like, you have money, it's a means. Sometimes there's no means, Allah Rabbul Izzah does it. Sometimes there's no way on God's earth that it would happen, Allah Rabbul Izzah still does it. So he says, Allah Rabbul Izzah does it with means, without means, or against means. So to believe like that, do you know what it does to you? Like, you become free from the shackles of humanity. You're no longer afraid of anything. 
Every other man is afraid. Where am I going to get food for my kids from? You say, Inna Allah huwa al-razzaq zul quwwatil matin. Everyone else is thinking, who will pay the mortgage? Who will, who will pay the rent? And who will pay the fees? And, and you are thinking, Allah Rabbul Izza will provide. One of the brothers was in a difficult financial situation. So they made dua. And next day, a lady comes into the house and knocking, uh, I want to buy this product that you have. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, ni'ma, ahlan wa sahlan, sit down. So the person sat and in the sitting bought 20,000 worth of goods. And then, so the man asks, how did you, how did you hear about us? He says, she said, the universe sent me to you. The universe sent me. He said, no, Allah sent you to me. Do you see when you've been in and out times and people you know, so when you believe to the extent that your reliance is so on Allah Rabbul Izzah, it frees you, it liberates you. Nothing matters, as in nothing scares you. Like Yusuf alayhi salam, you'll go to jail. He said, Astijnu ahabbu ilayya. The prison is more dear, like more beloved to me than, than what you guys are promising me. Hunger, khalas, Allah Rabbul Izza will feed me. Sickness, Allah Rabbul Izza will cure me. Guidance, Allah Rabbul Izza will guide me. Inni muhajirun ila Rabbi sayahdeen. I will migrate to Allah Rabbul Izza. He will guide me. So belief like that, that is the requirement of belief for the help of Allah Rabbul Izza to come. So when Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas took the plunge in the river, there's no doubt in his head that, that I might sink, I might not sink. Allah Rabbul Izzah, I am in the path of Allah. And point number two, point number two is that be on haq. Be on haq. Allah Rabbul Izzah says, in tansuru Allah yansurkum. So long as you're helping Allah Rabbul Izzah, He will help you. As in, so long as you're on haq, and so long as you're going to the cause of, of what is the truth and the cause of deen, your reliance is on Allah Rabbul Izzah. He will help me. And the stories are so many that Allah Rabbul Izzah's divine help has come to the believers. Um, again, back to the time of Afghanistan, like when, because they wouldn't let you leave the country. So they had check posts, at, you know, in strategic locations to stop the Muslims from migrating out towards Pakistan and so on and so forth. So there's this location, the Muslims came there to cross, but there's a checkpoint. And they're stuck, if they cross, they will shoot. So they sat and made dua to Allah Rabbul Izzah, Ya Rabb, do something for us that we can cross from this checkpoint and they can't see us. So Allah Rabbul Izzah opened the heavens with water and a gush of rain comes in that location at that specific time between the people who are going towards the hijrah and the check post of the Russians. So it's so heavy that they can't make out people on the other side. So they would cross from the other side. And Allah left it as a sunnah there. So that for years, any time people needed to cross, they would come there and wait for that same time that Allah had opened the sky for their brothers. The sky would open as in rain would come. They would cross. These people would be oblivious to them crossing. The help of Allah Rabbul Izzah. So, the first thing, strengthen your beliefs. And Iman increases with obedience of Allah Rabbul Izzah. And it increases with ta'ah. 
and it increases with the remembrance of Allah Rabbul Izzah. The closer you are to Allah Rabbul Izzah and in, in your obedience, the more Iman and belief and faith your heart becomes filled with. The second point, be helpers of Allah Rabbul Izzah. Be helpers of the religion of Allah Rabbul Izzah and Allah will help you. Point number three, unity. In our study, you will see inshallah next week or the week after. One of the governors of one of the cities of Persia, or one of the generals of one of the cities of Persia, was fighting to the end. And when the Muslims came and took over the city, he went to a tower. And he locked himself up. And they've come around him to try to get him out. And he says, listen, Muslims, what do you want? I have a hundred arrows in my quiver. And I will shoot a hundred times. And trust me, each one will kill one of you. Each arrow will hit its mark and it will kill one of you. And is one man worth a hundred men? Like, is my life really worth a hundred men? And is the, you know, the wealth that is with me worth a hundred of your men? And what will you do with me after I've killed a hundred of you? So they said, what do you want? He said, I will surrender. I will surrender myself if you place my hand in the hand of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So they said, okay. So he left the quiver and the bow and arrow and he came down. So they took him to Umar ibn al-Khattab and this is a long journey all the way to Medina. They sent him with a delegation. And when he reached Medina, they put on his normal clothes, like, you know, the pomp and ceremony of the Persian rule. You know, and they had uh, uh, jewels and rubies and diamonds and emeralds on, on their clothing. And he's wearing a fancy garb and, you know, the crown and, and you know, his, his, and they bring him like this to Umar ibn al-Khattab. So when he came to Medina, they went to the house of Umar radiallahu anhu Umar, and they knocked and they said, where is Umar? They, uh, he said, he's not here. He's gone to see a delegation from Kufa. He's in the masjid. So they went to the masjid and he's not in the masjid. And this man is being paraded and it is, it is a sight in Medina. Like in Medina, this is not the norm. You know, the simple people here, this guy has come like a king walking uh, and being, be, they're carrying him in chains, you know, so, or, or tied up. So some little kids come playing around. So they go, are you looking for the Amir al-Mu'mineen? They go, yes. So he goes, he's sleeping there besides the masjid on his shaw. So they went and found Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He took his cloth off and he's put it under his head and he's sleeping. So they didn't want to disturb the Khalifa, so they go, shh, sit quiet, wait for him to wake up. So this guy uh, says, where is Umar? And he says, subhanallah, that one day is Umar. Uh, so he said, where is his gods? Where is, you are a people that have just conquered Persia. Where is the guards? Where is the court? Where is the scribes? Where is the people that he does this to and they go and do an amr and he does this and where are the people that fan him? You know, they had those ostrich, those, uh, uh, they had these fans in the olden days that they used to decorate with peacock feathers and stuff like that and they used to fan the kid because there was no acorns and stuff, no, no, you know, there's no fans, so they used to fan. Where in this hot weather, where is, where is his pool? So they go, no scribes, no guards, no nothing. That is Umar, radiallahu an Umar, the Khalifa of the believers, Amir al Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al Khattab. So in talking, Umar woke up. So when he woke up, he said, Who is this? Who is this enemy of himself? Like as in, because he's wearing such lavish clothes. Who is? So they said, 
he is the general from this place and he's made a con and no Omar seeing him he said is this the general from this place they said yes so he said he has come to talk to you because I won't talk to him when he's dressed like this go put simple clothes on him so they took it all off and they put the normal simple cloth uh, and he sits looking nervous so Omar radiallahu anhu tells him um, he goes, what is, tell me, what is your situation? And don't you see how Allah has dishonored you and disgraced you after all the pillaging and all the robbery and, the, you know, the, the things that you did to the citizens of the people and you broke your oath with me time and time again. So this man says, and listen carefully, he says, before, before we used to fight you and it was us against you and there was no Allah on your side and there was no Allah on our side like Allah Rabbul Izzah wouldn't help you and he wouldn't help us because you were wrong we were wrong before like before Islam in the days of Jahiliyyah so we fared better against you and we beat you and now you became Muslims so Allah Rabbul Izzah helps you, he's on your side, and there's no Allah on our side, so we lose. And Allah has disgraced us. Look at the understanding of a general of Persia, that it's not your men, it is the help of Allah that is on your side. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, and our unity. And our unity. And that in itself is the help of Allah Rabbul Izza. Qala subhana wa allafa bayna qulubihim law anfaqta ma fil ard jami'an ma allafta bayna qulubihim walakinna Allah allafa baynahum. Allah Rabbul Izza put unity in the hearts of the believers. So a secret of success and a secret of attaining the help of Allah Rabbul Izza is to be united. And Allah Rabbul Izzah says, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُ وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ وَاصْبِرُوا And obey Allah and obey His Prophet. And don't quarrel and dispute amidst each other. You, you will fail and lose your haybah that exists in the hearts of men. So the third of the points, after belief and after being on the haq and on the path of Allah Rabbul Izzah is to be united. Muslims learn to be united over little trivial, trivial things. There's no need to break each other's heads. Learn to overlook certain things. Put things in its perspective. Say, khalas, this brother is doing something wrong, but he's wrong from 1 to 10 is probably 0.1. There's no need to become his enemy over this. And work for your unity. And put out fires of discourse amidst yourselves. You know, two brothers are in conflict. Say this brother said this nice thing about you. No, I don't think he's like that. Maybe he's busy. Make excuses for each other. And the early Muslims were very cautious of the Amr breaking and the Ummah becoming scattered. The fourth point, preparation and due diligence. The early Muslims didn't win by coincidence. They prepared for whatever field they were in. If they were students, you know, you go look at the early Muslims. To be a Hafiz was the norm. Like after the early, gen like after the time of the, like in the time of the Ashab. The children, it was the norm to be Hufal. I was listening to one lecture from one of the brothers. And he said one of the kings of 
Maghrib of the area of Morocco and this type of area wanted a bride for his son but he wanted to make sure she's a good girl so he sent a caller that whoever has a daughter who is a hafiz, a hafiz like who has memorized the Quran put a candle in your window tonight so that we know that there's a sister here who is a hafiz of the Quran and who can be a suitable match for the son of the Amir. So that night, the whole of the city had a candle in, in their windows. Everyone that has a daughter has memorized the Quran. So he thinks, well, alhamdulillah, but this is not going to help my cause. So next night, he sends the messenger out. Whoever's memorized the Quran in these books of hadith put a, a candle out. And although the numbers were less, but the predominantly there were candles on the windows. There was a time where we were prepared knowledge-wise. Where we were prepared, you know, militarily. We were prepared politically. We used to do our due diligence. Don't think it was accidental, khalas, bismillah, alhamdulillah, everything will be okay. They thought, they strategized. When the Muslims came to the conquest of Persia, some of the Persians turned towards them, like as in turned on the side of the Muslims, especially in attacking the capital. Now, the Muslim army didn't have catapults. You know those big slingshot things that chucks rocks and fire from afar they didn't have that so they asked these persians make make some of those weapons for us so they built catapults for them so they didn't go with their swords sticking it in the walls of the palaces they said if we can use this technology and this tool and this preparation let's do it they were students of the prophet they understood that al akhdu bil asbab sunnah so they used whatever means they had to its max if it was knowledge languages the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would send go learn the language of the jews and he came back oh prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam i can speak it and i can write it better than them they used to do their preparation and although they were simple but they were not backwards there's a difference there's a difference you can be simple but very advanced you can choose a simple way of life but a very advanced way of life and you can be very pompous as it is today have a lot of show but very little worth inside so therefore, preparation is a requirement. Allah Rabbul Izzah says, وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةِ And prepare for them, as in for your challenges, whatever you can from might and power. And knowledge is power, Muslims. If it wasn't power, they wouldn't have hacked the phone of the Chancellor of Germany. Knowledge is power. Become learned, especially for the youngsters. In whatever field you are, and you can be in any field that you are. You're, you're a bricky, a laborer, a plasterer, a mechanic, an engineer, a psychologist, whatever field, master it. Subhanallah, I was reading this history of Japan. Uh, of Japan. One, you know, Japan's had a rough history, feudal history. And then one of the, you know, when they came under one rule, they realized that in the field of industry, they're very far behind. Great fighters, loyal fighters, but very far behind in industry. So one of their professors told one of the youngsters, one, one of his students, he goes, your mission, and subhanallah, the Japs have this zeal. You know, when they put their heads to something, it is either success or what they do, that hurry-curry thing, they open their stomach, that type of thing. Either success or death. 
And it's not something I am preaching, but I'm saying that's what the Japs are like. So, <laughs> unless you misunderstand. So, then, your mission is, go and prepare industry in Japan. And what I want you to do is make a plant which produces cars in Japan. So they are, they're starting from scratch. So the young man has to figure out how does metal work. So for eight years, he went and became students of blacksmiths and laborers and builders to learn the characteristic, because the blacksmith makes a certain thing, the builder uses it for a certain way, to understand the diff. For eight years, this is a student of knowledge, a university student, he's gone to learn at the hands of blacksmiths and laborers and builders. And when his master, the feudal lord, found out that eight years this young man has dedicated his life for the progress of Japan, he sent him 5,000 silver pieces. You know, silver blocks or what, uh, you know, the, uh, the currency of Japan, or what they had then. So, and he said, I want to meet you, dear student, like you honor of, of Japan, I want to meet you. He said, no master, no sir, I haven't succeeded yet, I don't deserve to see you. My mission isn't accomplished yet. When I build the plant in Japan, then I will come and see you. So he took this 5,000 silver blocks and he set up his own plant. What, imagine in that type of plant, like this is a pilot plant if you like, that with his knowledge of metals to make the first car. But he needs workers and he doesn't have money. So he used to work for a month take his money and then give it to the laborers that used to work with him. Do you understand? So eight years learning, now he's built his plant. Nine years passed. Nine years of day and night struggle passed. After nine years he made five cars. And he took these five chunky cars. Because understand, they're not slick and de these are cars that are made, you know, the first batch. That, and he took it to the house of this ruler of Japan. And the cars are outside and he's turned them on. And look at an intelligent leader. He comes. And he says, I have not heard music better than the sound of the engine of these cars. And cars are not nice sounding, but to praise and to glorify an action. He says, there's nothing better sounding than the sound. And, and he says, he says, we have conquered Europe. And today, the cars of Japan there's not a country that the cars do not sell in. So for the young, the build so that through your success and in the light of your success, Islam can bask. With your success, right now, they deliberately associate failure with you. Failed states failed revolutions, failed springs, failed dreams, failed leaders, failed... You, you look, you ask, go do a survey around Mirabuka. Ask the non-Muslims of Mirabuka, put five, ten questionnaires, what is your image of Islam? And it will give you a person with a cable bashing a lady, or it will give you the image of a person, uh, you know, digging up old graves to show that we don't worship graves anymore, or blow, it's, it's a rotten image that they have associated with the religion that came to set mankind free. So only through your success can you change it. When a Muslim 
proud Muslim, practicing Muslim, intelligent Muslim, articulate Muslim, achieved Muslim, can come out at the pinnacle of every field, then the world is forced to accept the superiority and the discipline of the faith. So therefore, push yourselves, youngsters especially, push yourselves and leave these tools that were designed to put you to sleep. Put a little stopwatch next to your table. Every time you're on Facebook, click it as in count and measure how many hours of your day goes on Facebook. And how many hours goes and fighting with the quarrels of Facebook. He called me this. I'm, I'm, I'm at school and they said, sir, he called me this. Okay, where? On Facebook. Hours of a young person's time. What's my rating? How many people liked my picture? Like it. You like it. They put the, put, like it. And these are not Dao organizations. For Dao, I can understand. Like it so other people can see it. But this poor person's done, <laughs> done a little smile, like it. Ya yeah, subhanallah, why? Like, do you get a dollar coin when I like it? If the whole world were to like your picture, would you get an extra piece of bread? Will it pay your rent, sweetheart? But they have made these little ridiculous games. And young and old has got so busy. YouTube, and you know it has damaged the brains of the youngsters. I don't say it as a joke. In our time, they used to say there's a, you have a concentration span of 45 minutes. You know, for 45 minutes you can concentrate. So, alhamdulillah. Later on, I, I found out now 35 minutes. And today, you look at a child, put him in front of a YouTube, you know. The, the web, the, you know, YouTube channel, and get him here and record. Two minutes, click something else. Two minutes, one mi He sees a one minute clip, oh, I can't watch that too long. One minute clip, I swear. I sent a dawah clip to a brother, he goes, Akhi, I don't have the patience to click on the, what, what, what is it? It's a one minute something second clip. But it's the majority of it, for the majority of the masses, total waste of time. And understand, it is a great way to learn. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of ilm there. But the majority of it is just laughs and giggles. And, you know, annoyance. Why can't I find something good? Why can't, oh, not you again. Not why can't I find something good? That, by the way, is a click. So, point is that the youth need to detach themselves from these time-wasting mechanisms. So much nonsense. And let everyone else waste their time. What a golden opportunity, wallahi, Allah has offered you. Let them be busy and waste time. You shine. If you don't have WhatsApp, get WhatsApp. I'm not getting it. I'm studying. I'm working. Be productive. Make, build, learn. So, that is the fourth point. Due diligence. Do your preparation, Muslims. The fifth one, patience. Be patient. They say Rome wasn't built in one day. Just coming here, um, my brother, Allah bless him, inshallah, and protect him. Um, played a little clip of a student of knowledge who went to learn hadith. And sitting and learning hadith is difficult, a lot of memorization, you know, and ilmul rijal and this, it, it, you, too much. So he tried for a little while and he goes, this is too difficult, and khalas packed up and, and went. And then walking he saw um, a stream from which water was dripping on a rock. And he saw that it has made uh, a dent, you know how when the water c keeps on hitting something, uh, it kind of digs into it. So he said, I told myself that water is very soft, the rock is very hard. 
Yet the soft little thing has carved into this very hard thing. An ilm is soft, but my heart is not as hard as that rock. So if I stick to it, it will carve into my heart. So he went back into it. And slowly, slowly, he became one of the big authorities of hadith. Patience. They say, and this is, um, don't, uh, I don't know its accuracy. We were taught this as, as children. They say Alexander the Great. Um, you know, and Alexander conquered a great chunk of the globe. A huge warrior. History calls him the Great. You know, these days, um, you're, if you're a... A, a, a politician, your, your PR people call you great to give you a little, you know, uh, that's fake because, you know, you've paid them to do a job. When history calls you great, there's something to be proud of. History calls him Alexander the Great because of his conquests and so on. So one day he was in, in camp and he's finding this battle very difficult and uh, he doesn't seem to be able to crack these people. And sitting there in the camp, he saw a little ant hold uh, some kind of food and is trying to climb up the wall, you know, of the trench. And climbing up halfway, he fell down. So Alexander's watching him because they're in waiting, so it's, you know, there's nothing to do. This is the closest thing you can get to a TV in those days. So he gets this, watches this ant, goes up again. So after a third time, Alexander decides, I'm going to record how many times this ant tries. So every time he went up, Alexander drew a line. And after 180 something tries, the ant got to the top. So Alexander said, ah, if you try once and fail, try again. These are not his words, this is words later, but I'm paraphrasing. So, Alexander the Great went into this with new resolve and conquered that land. Point is, don't expect to do everything overnight. You open a book, halas, I should have memorized it by now. You know, you, um, you do an exercise, you go to the gym one day, you know, I don't look like Hercules, this is not working, you know. Uh, martial arts... <laughs> You know, in the initial stages of martial arts, it's pretty strange. You watch, you know, the early people doing martial arts. You can't kick very high, so he goes, I can't do it. And just jumping from, from field to field like this now. Have the patience and the perseverance. Take things through. But at the same time, know when something's not working. If you're hitting your head against the brick wall, khalas, it's a brick wall, might move to the side, find, find a softer place. So have the patience, Muslims, and the perseverance to keep going and especially in da'wah da'wah is a game of patience the battle between haq and batal isn't supposed to be an overnight one it's a constant struggle and istiqama is the key so keep persistent do a little amount but do it regularly may allah rabbul izza bless you inshallah